Yep, so second day of labs, first session. Um, and I'm doing something something a bit different from my usual presentation here today. This is not a Richard has everything sorted out and knows what he's talking about kind of thing. Um, this is much more sort of me sharing how I see the world at the moment and how I see things going and wanting to start some discussions and start some questions. And I've put this all together for 45 minutes and I've got like 60 something slides. So please forgive me if I shoot through some of them quite quickly and we're going to keep them in the slide deck for but being able to refer to them later. Uh, nobody's hearing any audio. Can anybody hear me? Someone could just say in the chat. Otherwise, for me. Good, fine, okay. Um, sorry, Richard, good luck fixing what you're doing. Um, yeah, so who am I? Um, I'm Richard. Um, I've been working in OpenSUSE since it began. I've been part of SUSE for seven years now. Um, and I'm a passionate advocate of rolling releases. I work in Torsten's future technology team, working on two of those rolling releases, MicroOS and, and Cubic. Um, we have an agenda, and I'm going to start by talking about you know how upstreams are well, how upstreams are and how they're more and more these days. And of course, I'm talking in a labs conference, so I'm kind of preaching to the choir really with this. Um, but starting at the beginning, you know, upstreams, up, yeah, upstreams update stuff very, very quickly. You know, upstream releases, you know, typically in most projects, you know, you're talking about every couple of months, the kernel, even Kubernetes is rolling out new updates every three months. Um, more complicated stacks, you know, things like Podman, Scorpio Builder, and Cloud Foundry are just constantly updating all of the time. And, you know, these, this poses challenges to us as a company who then have to kind of, you know, dilute these and concentrate these into something we can actually you know, give to customers in a way our customers can actually handle it because, you know, this is far too fast for any, any customer and most users to be able to deal with. And most of these upstream projects have incredibly short support periods. And when we say support, we're of course we're totally talking about things like you know patches and CVEs, and in some cases also API and ABI uh, stability. Although there's differences with that. You know, a typical kernel release lasts four months before it's replaced by the next kernel release. You know, even LTS releases have six or seven years of support, which is you know half as long as we support a SLU release. Um, you know, Kubernetes just made this really long effort over like the last three years to finally increase their support with lifecycle. You know, they went from a whole nine months to one year, um, which it's incredibly short. Um, and even, you know, projects like SaltStack, you know, only have a year and a half in reality they're kind of, it's pretty much frozen after six months. It, it's just, you know, one and a half years if something appears later on um, and projects like that with two years. Of course, you know, who cares if things are updating if, if old versions are compatible? Um, you know, the kernel, of course, is, is famous when it comes to, you know, always keeping user space stable, or the user space API stable. Um, but, you know, that's only part of the story. And then when you start looking at things like ABI, you know, if you compile it, will it still be portable everywhere else? You know, the for years we talked about the Linux standard base and, you know, LSB being the holy grail where everything's going to, you know, be fine. You, you build it for one distribution and if it's LSB compliant, it can work everywhere. Um, is anybody LSB5 certified? I, I don't, I know we still have some LSB packages in SLE. I know we don't have any LSB packages at all in, in OpenSUSE. Um, and I can't find any evidence of, of anyone really paying any attention to that these days. Um, for most of the other projects I mentioned previously, you know, the API and ABI compatibility promise is basically the same as a support window. So, you know, you're updating a version every couple of months or a year. And then, you know, well, we might drop or add or remove or change how APIs work, uh, APIs work, you know, at will. You know, Kubernetes has put a lot of effort into being sort of uh, <laughs> more enterprise friendly, they say. But in reality, you know, that that you know the only guarantee is you know an API that's there today might be there and you know, can, can, will be there at least for twelve months, unless it's a admin facing CLI interface, in which case you know the longest you can guarantee it's going to be there is six months. So these you know are, are the the challenges that we deal with. We we know that we, we work at SUSE. Um, but you know, but SUSE is changing too. You know, we're not just a Linux company anymore. We're not just dealing with you know the Linux distribution and that sort of bubble of stuff around the Linux distribution. You know, we have 
complicated products, our storage product manager, and the whole kind of cloud and native stuff with Casp and Cap and you know more to come with, with the Rancher acquisition, hopefully. And when you look at Casp and Cap and the whole cloud native uh, ecosystem, you know, you, 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 I, I, I've kind of started realizing that Kubernetes is the next Linux in the sense of, you know, it's the API which people want to write against. You know, you have people talking about their application being a Kubernetes application. It's not a container application. It's not a Linux application. They've designed it, built it for Kubernetes, and they're seeing Kubernetes as a sort of one grand API which they write to. Um, but then you look at how the cloud native ecosystem works or is, and you know this is the simplest diagram I could find that explains you know what the Kubernetes and Kubernetes ecosystem is like. You know around that around that core that we call Kubernetes, there are literally thousands and thousands of products that are interoperating with it, providing services that aren't provided by the core. You know the, the sort of the traditional typical. Uh, sort of the like problem that we solved by putting things in the Linux distributions. But in Kubernetes land, you know, these typically are modules which customers want to be mixing, matching, choosing their own, bringing their own. You know, we don't select everything from this ridiculous map and put it in our cast or cap product. You know, we select which parts of this we want to be able to maintain and support, which parts we have enough stuff to look at and, and, and maintain. And then everything else we just say, you know, that's a customer's problem or a partner's problem. Um, and so all of these are updating at a rapid pace. All of these are moving at a rapid pace. Projects appear and disappear from this at will. And um, if anybody has zoomed in and realized, um, there's a little note in the top right hand corner of this slide that says, you know, all the great icons are not open source. You know, this is, even though Kubernetes is an open source project, even though a good chunk of the project, is, a good chunk of the ecosystem is open source, you know, there's tons of parts out there that are not open source, they're closed. And, you know, we need to figure out how to work with them and how to, you know, work yeah you know, interoperate interoperate with the Middle East as well. Even with the projects that we sort of you know are invested in that we are contributing to, you know, these projects are always getting bigger. You know, Kubernetes is now, you know, well this is actually an old graph, you know, Kubernetes is now over two million lines of code and just over eight thousand files. Um, you know, the public APIs are mostly stabilizing. Um, but of course they do dip and they do increase because with that sort of 12 months support window, you know, sometimes things get uh, deprecated and removed quite harshly. And sometimes things finally get updated after years. And this is equally true, you know, with more established projects like the kernel um, and, you know, citing for this article where they point out, you know, there's more lines of code and there's less developers and there's less maintainers, which, you know, at SUSE, we don't mean we're not less, but we we you know we we experience this problem. You know, we've never as a company we've never grown as fast as the upstream code bases that you know we're we're using. I mean, why should we? If they're healthy, we're healthy. You know, you're never not always going to grow it sort of in time with that. But it means when they're moving faster, we have to find ways to be more efficient. We have to find ways to consume what upstreams are doing better. We have to find ways of bringing that to our customers more easily for the customers and also more easily for ourselves. In parallel to doing that, you know, like with the cloud native side of things, you know, there's more new upstreams out there. They're all moving fast. We're joining them quicker and quicker. And I mean, obviously, this is this statement here is somewhat biased by the fact I work in the future technology team. So most of my exposure to customers is, you know, future orientated. But I do have this feeling that customers are increasingly aware and interested in what upstream developments are doing. You know, the, the hype hype is real when it's well marketed. You know, some, there's plenty of customers out there who are jumping on this cloud native thing just because they've heard other people talking about it. Um, but that means that those become business questions. You know, the, those are you know, people asking, you know, why don't you have that new feature in that new version that I read about somewhere? Um, so we need to have answers to these challenges, you know, and, and figure out better ways of working with those upstreams or working from those upstreams as part of them. Looking at this a little bit more from the customer's perspective, too, um, I wanted to kind of figure out you know, how much market share does SUSE have? You know, how, how big a player are we in this whole thing? And you know, where could we grow from there? Um, so looking at this sort of from the developer side of things, you know, this is um, Stack Overflow's question charged by distribution. 
you know, SUSE doesn't even appear in Stack Overflow because we're not even large enough to justify ourselves having a tag. Um, but you know, Ubuntu is of course incredibly popular. Um, CentOS and Red Hat, of course, you know, the next two biggest there. This is also what you see when you look at you know SUSE's presence on you know the internet. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, yeah, it doesn't matter exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly which website you know we're not a big player when it comes to the web server market obviously um but even if you try and find some sort of data that sort of shows the kind of more comprehensive server market you know red hat are the big fish making all the money we're somewhere in that 18.3 percent um, and you know we want to grow from from there but that means that you know our customers who are you know our new customers those customers we want to get the ones we haven't got already you know, they're going to be coming with an expectation of it's, you know, that our Linux should be, or they'd be more likely exposed to, you know, Ubuntu. They'd be more likely exposed to Red Hat. They're going to expect things work similarly to how they do. They're going to expect things to move at a pace similar to how they do. Um, and they're going to expect sort of, yeah, a feature set and a, uh, a development model that, that's, it, it either or that they will compare against. That's what we're that's what we're competing with. Those expectations that customers have got because we're not the largest player in this market. There's, yeah, and we're unlikely to be anybody's first Linux. And this kind of also brings me to the next point of you know when you compare us to to Rail or Ubuntu, you know the two more popular competition competitors of us, you know we support you know. Our enterprise distro for three years longer than RHEL and our, you know, and eight years longer than Ubuntu, um, and it, it leads me to an interesting question. I don't have an answer to this at all, but it's like, you know, is this a good thing or a bad thing? You know, are we have we found a really good niche by supporting SLE for for thirteen years or even longer because we have customers that want like twenty five years or whatever, or do we lose customers because we're seen to be upgrading too slow? We're seen to be too conservative. You know, did Ubuntu and, and RHEL get the, the market they did, at least in part, because they didn't quite stretch it to the day for a couple of years? Um, but I don't have the answer, but I did want to ask the question. Um, do you also see, as uh, um, you know, as as I've been at SUSE for seven years now, and, and you know, open SUSE for longer, you know, our products are getting more complicated, but also the way our customers use it is getting more complicated. You know, when I started at SUSE, customers like bought SLE and they dumped SLE in, and it solved all their problems and everything was fine. I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you know, that was typically the way sales seems to work. You know, a customer would come to you at a conference, tell you about this one problem, they buy SLE, they're happy, they've gone. Um, I, I see that as an increasingly rare way that we we ship our products. You know, typically they're buying it as part of some whatever product they be, SLE or SES or Manager, etc., and Carson Cap. You know, they buy them as part of a larger solution, some bigger project they're doing where they've got other stakeholders and they've got other pieces, uh, you know, other pieces going on, other partners they're working with. Um, and, and the SUSE product is an important part of that, but it often means that the project succeeds, fails, or we get requirements from, from PM or, or partner management, et cetera, that show that this project like, clearly has like external dependencies. You know, they, they, we need to get it working with this. We need it to be working on this hardware that hasn't come out, we, et cetera, et cetera. And so you know, the, the requirement for interoperability seems to be getting higher and higher and higher. Um, and some of these dependencies are like totally out of our control. You know, these aren't open source projects. These aren't um, things we can influence. That you know, and sometimes it's you know something that isn't even out yet. Um, but if yeah, you know, I think we we at least sometimes we fall into a trap of of you know being a little bit too stubborn in those questions. You know, we say we're going to support this, and we've declared our support life cycles, and we say this one thing. Um, but if 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 we're too dogmatic with that, you know, if 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 our SUSE product is just a cog in a much larger machinery, you know, is it really the defining cog? You know, is it really if if we put our foot down and are too dogmatic with our support life cycles and our you know what we can put in our products, how likely is it the customers will actually stick with their decision to go to SUSE or they'll just look somewhere else with somebody who has something that you know that better fits what they want? 
So, you know, if, in order to, I think the route to being more able to interoperate with all of this other stuff is to also be more adaptable. And, you know, we can't adapt if our code base is frozen for 15 years. That's just simple logic. Um, I, I was reading some uh, sort of, yeah, uh, additional work, uh, work on this is sort of yeah, consumer psychology and, and sort of innovation, innovation psychology. Um, and you know, there basically is, is this school of thought that seems to hold true at least that you know, there are five categories for innovation adopters. You know, innovators, you know, the ones that are most willing to take risks. And also when you look at their sort of social status and financial status, they're the ones that typically are sort of well, defined in, in this paper as you know, financially fluid. You know, they have money, they're willing to spend money. They're not, they're willing to spend money sometimes a bit more riskily than, than perhaps they should. Um, and then you, know, you work down the scale of, of early adopters, early majority and late majority and, and, and like else, who are the ones that are least willing to take risks and, and least financially fluid. Um, and so when a product or a technology is, is in the market, you typically see sort of an adoption rate that kind of works like this, where, you know, there's, there's a small percentage, you know, who dive on very, very quickly. The technology gets more and more popular and, you know, reaches some nice sort of midpoint where, you know, it's starting to take over the world and then everybody kind of comes along at the end. Um, <laughs> and no, it's not a COVID curve, but the, yeah, funny. Um, you know, typically with, with our SUSE products, I, I think we, we typically target late majority or, or even perhaps sort of laggards to, to on this bell curve. You know, but when you look at the, uh, the, the, the stuff we're doing with our, our new products, you know, the cloud native stuff, our track two initiatives, you know, it, it's clear that as a company, we need to be aiming more of, you know, um, you know, in addition to, I'm not saying in the exclusion of, but in addition to, you know, aiming more towards the earlier part of that bell curve and, and really appealing to those fast and moving early adopting customers. And we see that actually happening, not just in isolation. There are plenty of other businesses looking at how they can succeed, especially in these COVID times. Um, and, you know, everybody's reading the same papers and looking at these same issues. Um, and, and so we actually see this even when you look in, inside, you know, our own feature request. You know, if you just look at the list of very high customer interest in Jira in, in the PM pool, you know, there is a never ending pile of, oh, we want this shiny new version on this old code base. You know, we need, you know, this updated for TLS 1.3. We need Wireguard. We need all of the AI ML stuff. And we want it on Sleep 15 and we want to support it for 15 years. But, you know, the, there's no shortage of customers that are clearly finding that our product isn't moving fast enough for them now, making requests to go faster. And I, I find some of these come from kind of, at least to me, really interesting areas um, and, and kind of unexpected areas. Like, you know, when I think of a HPC customer, I typically think of, you know, a supercomputer that once it's been deployed, they're being rather conservative about what they do with it. Um, and then you read comments like from, from this feature request where, you know, basically every HPC customer pretty much always wants to have the latest version of every single library. Um, and yeah, if you if you actually look at the feature request, that, that seems to be true. Um, um, and that's a, a, an interesting realization that, you know, even even our most conservative customers with our most conservative products, you know, sometimes need or want to move rather quickly. And that's why if you look at actually what we're already doing on the enterprise products, you know, we already roll in some respects. You know, if you look at SLEE 15, for example, you know, the product in the GA release, you know, two years ago now, you know, it started with 3,517 source packages. You know, in, in our service packs, we only add new source packages that over, you know, override or replace the ones in, in the base system or in the GA release. And, and you know, one third of that was, was you know, effectively, you know, updated in some way in service pack one. Pretty much half of that was updated again in, in service pack two. Um, the on the on the update channels, you know, where we're being conservative because you know the maintenance updates, we're making you know as small a change as possible. You know, we still managed to do seven thousand updates on on three fifteen. Um, you know, admittedly only for you know a third of the code base, but but that's that's a rate of change that you know. Even if we do it everything right, everything absolutely perfect, are we really one hundred percent sure that that 
SLE 15 GA today is going to behave as SLE 15 GA really worked two years ago? And I think the obvious answer to that is, is no. Um, and then when you look at package hub, which of course is that kind of crossbreed of, of community interest, partner interest, and, and you know, others of course, because we do, we do uh, moderate it at least. You know, there's 8,000 packages now in, in SLE 15 package hub, or effectively 10,000 for, for SP2. You know, and a, a constant stream of updates, a constant stream of new stuff, which customers are wanting, customers are using, and, and we are already delivering it. Um, inside those service packs, um, just looking at, at version updates, you know, because you know, rather than the, the the old mind or the traditional mindset of we keep everything static and we only backport fixes, you know, when you look at what's actually inside a service pack. You know, there are thousands of RPM version updates in every single service pack we do. You know, there should have been in, in, in GA, of course, you know, 2,500 compared to SP12, SP3, which actually was a little bit less than I was expecting. XKCD check might be lying to me. Um, but there are, you know, almost 3,000 new versions sitting there in 315 SP2. And we do version updates and update repos. Unfortunately, I don't have the data for that because I haven't been able to find a way there. And yes, Stefan, those version changes exclude all version changes due to rebuild. So that is just legitimate version bumps of the RPM from version A to version B. Um, yeah, that was fun passing that. I was wanting to do the same for our update repos, but because of how our update repos are done by modules and, and everything there, I, my head and my scripts and everything just exploded spectacularly. So. The only takeaway I can really give you is, you know, we also do version updates and update repos. You know, I'm sure we do it fine, but you know, we are we do roll, um, but we don't do it perfectly. You know, again, looking at our Jira, you know, we see plenty of examples from our customers where, you know, there's issues arising or requests arising from the way we are currently rolling in our enterprise products. You know, you have examples like SAP being very concerned about you know, things like our default. Uh, uh, configuration options changing and you know we don't currently track that we don't currently report it and there's no way for them to track it. there's no easy way for them to to report it or mitigate it um, this is something in open SUSE when micro s where we're you know trying to move everybody towards using like usr etc and etc to make our life easier with that um you, you see issues with package up which i'll talk more later um you know you see customers asking for thing for patch level tagging so you know, when we in tumbleweed they uh, those customers are already seeing you know we have a, ver a distribution that's always rolling you don't really have discrete version numbers um but we do flag you know effectively which patch level you're at um and they want to see the same even for our products that might be doing a regular release they want to also see what you know what patch level is that regular release distro um and you know we currently split things up into modules and we split things up into to, you know, various parts at, at uh, yeah, various different release schedules and update cadences. And you know, we definitely see that you know, we're not currently doing a great job at documenting that and being very clear about which components are supported for which lifecycle. Which is you know, a big challenge when things are, are split like we currently have. Um, so, you know, I've been looking at this problem for years. I've been messing around with rolling releases for a really long time. So I wanted to sort of share some of my observations and some of the assumptions that I hear when I talk to other people about this problem or these problems. You know, and the first the first thing that comes up every time you talk about rolling releases to anybody who isn't an absolute geek, you know, anybody who actually wants to use this in the real world and, and actually rely on this thing is, you know, why can't I just have a stable base and a rolling layer on top? You know, they, you know, just, just keep the base stable, release the faster on stuff. It's it's easy, right? Um, this is this is a bit like sort of thesis is paradox. You know the the story of you know the, the Greek ship in the museum. You know if you replaced one part a year, you know how many years would it be before you have a whole new ship? Um, which is an interesting thought experiment. You know, but it's also um, an area where we, we have actually had practical attempts at doing this. You know, the perfect example being the original Tumbleweed. You know, Tumbleweed originally started by Greg Froharman, the guy we all know as the kernel developer, um, in 2010, basically because, you know, he was working at SUSE and he didn't like using OpenSUSE because it was too slow for him. Um, and so, you know, it started as a rolling base on top of regular OpenSUSE releases. You know, it was 
wanted to he wanted to keep his amount of work to a minimum as well. So just have one repository with the kernel, KDE, the GNOME, some desktop apps, basically the stuff he was using daily. Um, and yeah, uh, update those that those things in that repository. Override any libraries or dependencies necessary in that repository. Um, and then, you know, every time there was a new regular release, just, you know, reset it to zero because the regular release would have all of the new stuff as well, right? Um, and, yeah, kind of move in a kind of semi-rolling fashion. Um, it, it was actually an absolute nightmare, both for users and as engineers. You know, from, from an engineering perspective, we found we it was constantly breaking because you constantly had this sort of growing chasm between the stable base and rolling top. Um, you know, the, as as the state as the rolling top got newer and newer and newer, and the the stable base stayed where it was. You know, there was replacing more and more libraries in order to facilitate that stuff you wanted in that rolling top, and that ad hoc tinkering and superseding of the stable base stopped it being stable. It was really really painful, um, and so you know, especially near sort of the end of the life cycle of a stable release. And we're not talking like a long lasting stable release here. We're talking about old open SUSE, so like every eight months, you know, you were finding that the tumbleweed was basically unusable because it, it was, you know, const it was replacing so much stuff to, the, to enable the, the, the new user space stuff. It was just, yeah, breaking randomly with bugs we couldn't debug in time. Um, then you'd have, you know, the new open SUSE release come along. So we'd reset everything to zero, destroy the, the tumbleweed repo, which ended up being absolutely brutally disruptive because users, you know, the, the assumption that oh, everything in that rolling tumbleweed is going to end up in, in the stable base was mostly true, but it didn't work in exactly the same way. It didn't have the same default configuration. It didn't have exactly the same libraries all mixed together. So that we didn't always have the same feature sets in every different application. Um, services behaved somewhat differently. You know, system D defaults were different, that kind of thing. Um, and so it was always brutally disruptive to users as well. Um, in parallel to this, you know, there was an effort of, of the old traditional rolling uh, open source factory development branch to find a way of making it more stable. Um, you know, it was already always building everything together and rebuilding the dependency tree because it was a development branch. So, you know, using OBS for its great advantage of being able to do reproducible builds. Um, but, you know, the main thing being added to that was really ex uh, excessive and increasingly excessive um, testing of use cases. You know, how users actually used it, how users actually cared about it. This is why OpenQA was sort of developed and, and put into it. It's also why, like, since then, there's been layers and layers of more tests added on. And Tumbleweed today, you know, is that what was actually factory. We kept the name, but the, the way it's developed is, you know, totally different from how Greg started. Um, and it's been doing that now for six years. There has been no large apocalypse. You know, there's been the occasional time when it's released stuff that, you know, we weren't testing properly and, and we had to improve the testing. Um, but that also means we could fix things very, very quickly too. Um, and for the target audience of you know enthusiast developers who want a very very fast rolling release, you know Tumbleweed has proven that you know this can be done. But I think the two kind of key lessons that we learned from that is you really do have to build everything together. You have to be prepared to change the entire code base just to facilitate that one tiny change that somebody wants, and that's a risky proposition. So you have to test everything that you care about. You have to be sure that you're not going to be breaking actual use cases that customers or users will be cared about. And this is a problem that I, I see that, you know, in some respects we're we're dealing with today with modules and package up. Um, and that, yeah, generally speaking, you know, we have SLE building the way it is. We do build it all together um, and we do test it all together, but also because of the way we deliver it, customers can't actually put up and figure out how it's meant to be used. If you are trying to install a package from Package Hub and you haven't added every single module which possibly you could ever possibly want, then you can quite easily get dependency issues because you know the package, yeah, package we built it all together, but we don't deliver it all together. And so you have this wonderful issue of you know customer does zipper install foo from Package Hub and they get a lovely, you know, nothing provides bar that I desperately need. And you have absolutely no way right now of actually 
figuring that figuring that problem out as a customer you know you have no ident no no clue which modules required um so you know ship building together testing together is great if you're not shipping it all together then it's not really great for the customers either so another quite common sort of approach that I hear right but that's fine you know all this rolling release stuff or you know getting newer stuff fast you know let's keep the base stable and then just release everything in containers or let's release everything in sandboxes and you know there's plenty of technologies out there to accomplish this and there's plenty of examples that try it you know one example being app image which is uh, admittedly rather desktop centric although I have seen some uh, server demons are using this approach. Um, for those that don't know, app images, you know, it's a, it's a, effectively an archive that's executable. It unpacks itself and runs itself from its own, yeah, from from its own fuse mounted file system contained in the archive. And it promises that you know this means that you know your Linux app can run absolutely everywhere, and it does have some popularity, some upstreams, including uh, uh, Linus himself releases a few things as app images. But that promise of it can run everywhere or anywhere is not actually true at all. Even the own documentation about how you package it admits that it doesn't run everywhere at all because inside your byte, inside your archive, you literally have to put every version of every library which you possibly could want on every distro, you know, the, the, to fulfill the gaps on every distro you might be targeting. You know, if you, and so for example, if you have, you know, an application that needs a specific version of glibc, and that glibc call is not in OpenSUSE or Fedora, then you're bundling glibc in that archive. <laughs> and then, you know, you're basically becoming a distribution engineer. Um, and as much as I love my job, I would not wish my job on the entire world. Um, so that does not really work as a sustainable option. Um, Flatpak came after uh, AppImage, you know, trying to solve some of the flaws uh, of the same thing. Um, you know, it's archiving stuff into OS tree, which, you know, same kind of basic idea, putting together, you know, binaries with their dependencies and, and uh, yeah, releasing it in a way that can work everywhere. Um, but it has a slightly different model. That uh, model basically means all of the, the core libraries. So things like your GTK, your Qt, um, you know, the, the kind of the, yeah, the runtimes, as, as they call it here, you know, where you're going to have an entire ecosystem of applications or an entire ecosystem of tools, you know, using those libraries, they're bundled separately. They have their own effectively container. Um, they're maintained separately. So, you know, app developers can target that runtime. Um, so the app developer doesn't have to worry about bundling all of that stuff in there. And then Flatpak itself takes care of all of the hassle of which runtimes are on which machine and how many copies and deduplication, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's an interesting idea. It works better than AppImage. Um, it works on every distribution that bothers to package Flatpak. Um, and Flatpak is quite a complicated demon and quite, Flatpak has some quite interesting dependencies and, you know, needs to make sure that, you know, your kernel's configured properly and all your libraries are configured right. So it doesn't eliminate the problem entirely. This, you know, your base system still needs to move in order to facilitate flatback being there. Um, but it does, you know, reduce the problem to a degree, um, assuming your effectively your application developer, your end, you know, your end user software developer is willing to, in essence, target that ecosystem. The flatback is its own ecosystem. You really pretty much have to write with that in mind, or at least be prepared to adapt your application to work in that way, um, which works really well for things like upstream GNOME and upstream KDE. Um, but um, if you're not working in sort of those bubbles where they have existing runtimes, then you're pretty much working on something like the uh, free desktop uh, runtime, which is basically a full blown distribution thrown in a runtime with all of its own libraries and stuff. So yeah, not perfect. Um, and you know, this isn't just a sort of like a desktop problem. You know, this is a problem that we see even in well thought out, popular, key, you know, keenly used and broadly used modern upstream stuff like Kubernetes. Um, this diagram is is an example of, of why I've getting gray hairs these days. Um, this is a basic OpenSUSE Kubernetes cluster um, where we're using what they call a containerized control plane. So you know the workload on your cluster is a whole bunch of containers. 
those containers are running in container runtimes and they're managed by a, a little daemon called kubelet and kubernetes itself is running in containers running in a control plane running in a container runtime running on kubelet um, which gives you a wonderful sort of bootstrapping and update problem um, because you have a situation where the containers need to be containing and running binaries equal or newer than the kubelet version um, and those Kubelet and container runtimes are just your traditional binaries running on the host OS, you know, delivered by RPMs, updating regularly. Um, which means all of, every single user running any Kubit cluster has to update their containers to the new version of the containers before they update any of the binaries. But they have to be done in sync with each other. They have to, you know, the, the Kubelet and container runtime must be compatible. The control plane must be, see, yeah, you have a sort of lovely catch-22 of, you know, how do you get the right Kubelet version on the right machine? How do you make sure the container version is the right way? You know, RPM knows nothing about the containers. Uh, yeah, it's fun and complicated. 10 minutes, wow, okay, speeding up a bit then. Um, yeah, so, the, you know, the way we figured that out in Kubic um, is we build everything together, you know, the containers, the Kubelet, the container runtimes, all released at the same time. We package Kubelet for multi-version. We basically deploy every possible version of Kubelet that customers could be supported onto all of their machines. And then we make the problem user spaces issue. You know, the user space tooling decides which binary is right for the right cluster version. And then when users are upgrading, you know, they can up get their upgraded con uh, container uh, control plane and flip things around. So in short, distribution or system isolated containers, it's a complete myth. It, it isn't true. You know, the containers are dependent on stuff on the base system. It keeps on happening. It will keep on happening. There's like five other examples in Kubernetes alone I could mention. So you do have to have a, a process of building and releasing containers in alignment with the traditional RPMs. And those containers like I said, can have like unfair dependencies that you have no way of modeling, no easy way of, of resolving. Um, and yes, yeah, so even if they're they're portable, you know, you, you not necessarily know that container is going to be able to run on your system until you try and run it on your system. And so, wanted to kind of share this concept of, of rolling first. You know, we all heard the term factory first because hey, it's what we all should be doing, contributing to factory first. But I, I want this idea of, of actually, even in our products, even not just contributing to OpenSUSE, but even when we're building our products. I want us to be thinking more and more about the possibility of engineering it as if it was a rolling release, you know, assuming that binary and library versions can change over the lifespan of the product, because they do already in sleep. Things already, functionality is already added, functionality is already removed, and yet we have this old mindset and we have this old mentality of, you know, oh, it's stable and therefore I can assume it's always going to be stable. It, it isn't, it does move already. We might as well accept it, embrace it, and, and milk it for everything that it's worth. Um, but of course, in the flip side of that, you know, we are selling enterprise software. We have to guard the essential functionality. We have to guard the essential usability. Um, this was originally uh, actually used to describe how we developed Tumbleweed. This is also now sort of yeah, all over our marketing is you know what our customers are doing with DevOps. Uh, I just threw it in there for um, old time's sake. Um, one rule that I found very, very, very true with rolling releases, and this is what I going back to early Tumbleweed, going back to Cubic, um, and then yeah, in pretty much every example I've given, really, you know, if you if you want to have a product where you can move anything, you know, where where any one part could be swapped out at some point, you need to have a process and the tooling and, and methodology, etc., where you can be able to move everything. You know, there is nothing. There is nothing sacred. In theory, everything can change, and that's the mindset you need to approach if you're going down this road of, of rolling first. But that doesn't mean when I say rolling, I don't mean rolling necessarily at full speed. This isn't tumble. Yeah, tumbleweed speed is not the only speed. Tumbleweed's proven we can go at the speed of contributions or the speed of upstream. When I talk about this here, I, I assume that you know our user products are going to be releasing at the pace of our market or customers. That's going to be slower. Um, that's that brings new challenges. That brings new questions that I don't have all the answers to. What is the right speed? Is sleep fast enough right now? Is could sleep be faster? Could sleep be slower? What does the market want? But if we have the approach of doing it this way, then you know we will be able to 
respond to customer demands more rapidly. We won't be quite so resistant when customer says, you know, I want that shiny new thing in my in, in there. You know, we will have the, the, the techniques, the tools, the processes to deal with that better. We'll also be able to keep more aligned and better of a, uh, yeah, better working relationships with our upstreams because it'll be more relevant to us and them. Um, theoretically, spread work more, more evenly throughout the year, so we're not having these huge spikes in the, you know, during periods of time. And also reducing corrective work in other teams. You know, what thing you see in, in a lot of the products based on Slee, for example, is they end up doing a bit like old Greco Hartman's tumbleweed. You know, replacing good chunks of big chunks of sleeve and doing a lot of re-engineering work because they don't have the version of whatever library in there in order to facilitate what they're doing. You know, that's double work. That's that's work that we really should find a way of eliminating as much as we can. Um, and in theory, this does this whole idea of, of you know rolling engineering doesn't necessarily mean rolling releasing. You know, customers might not see any of this. We can do all of this in you know, in our engineering departments. And still slap on version numbers and release it the way customers want to want to see it. There are some challenges or risks. You know, not every customer wants to move as fast as every other. This is the, the earlier question again. What is the right speed? Not every upstream is is perfectly aligned with their related uh, or dependent code bases. You know, but that's what we get paid for, right? Is is you know getting upstreams to talk to each other. Thanks, Dario. Um, and you know. We don't always know everything our customers are doing, you know, so you know, we always have the challenge of making it sort of usable for everything. Um, one way of dealing with this, or one way of doing this, of course, is making sure all of the essential functionality is captured, you know, so recorded from PM, recorded from customers, you know, modeled, properly tested, and used as a release gate. Not just like tested in some manual way and tested alongside, and then there's some meetings of this side, but actual sort of, you know, piping it into things like OpenQA or other CI CD tools and, and really sort of investing in that from, from all parts of the company, from PM, from QE, from engineering, etc. And also possibly redefining the scope of our products. You know, one thing we learned in MicroOS and with Cubic is if we narrow the scope of the operating system and then leverage containers as much as we can, you know, you, you do mitigate some of the risks of this approach. You know, because the OS is being updated less or has less things, there's fewer risks, there's fewer changes. Um, and you can, you know, even with the Kubernetes example, like, you know, you can let the containers drift ahead or a bit behind the code base for brief periods without really impacting compatibility. You just have to be then careful when you do like these massive, huge breaking changes. Um, and so this is kind of my mental image of how I possibly see things going forward. And yeah, this, you know, just brainstorming really. You know, right now we have tumbleweed. Tumbleweed is is seeding leap or jump, and you know, seeding our, our core. Uh, you know, which has nice regular releases. You know, why not have the next core be entirely rolling? You know, why not have all of our products and the next OpenSUSE leap? You know, all being released from that. And like I say, maybe being released as discrete versions may be being released as rolling releases. I'm, I'm, I'm split on that. But if it's if it's engineered rolling in, in, the, in, you know, in the background, at least, then we have a whole pile of flexibility to really get what our customers want when they want it, you know, far more easily than we're currently doing now. Um, and of course, I'm not saying, you know, this should be sort of with the exclusion of tumbleweed, you know, if we do it this way, then we can be cherry picking from tumbleweed repeatedly all of the time, rather than currently now where you get these sort of big chunking code dumps from, from tumbleweed and, and build a new code base from that. And yeah, so like I've repeatedly said, you know, we, and uh, you know, we currently target, you know, typically sort of late majority or laggard innovators. Um, you know, we need to be moving faster. We need to be having products that can move faster. Um, you know, maybe this idea is something destined for doing alongside our current way of doing things. Maybe the best way of dealing with this is changing how we currently do everything and then, you know, just releasing from this code base. And, you know, I'm well aware that, you know, some customers will be nervous about this. Um, but I think if we actually kind of are just frank with them of, you know, the realities that we're dealing with, the realities that are just out there with the tech, you know, the facts are kind of really on, on the side of, of doing things in this way. And then, you know, we tidy everything up at the end. Um, and with that, I've finally finished and I've got like 
30 seconds or so for questions. If anybody wants to turn the camera on. Yes, uh, thank you, Richard. And uh, uh, sure, if there are any questions. Something has, uh, I mean, something went on, so some commenting went on in the chat. I uh, had a look there, uh, there were uh, uh, comments and remarks uh, about many things, uh, not uh, really much questions. They, at, at some point, I saw uh, Lubush and Petra um, talking or maybe asking when you mentioned uh, um, Red Hat uh, uh, support. Uh, um, let me see. Yeah, okay, I find it. Uh, uh, there was a question from Lewis, which was uh, we're talking about the price book support, right? Uh, all of companies can have custom support. Uh, I mean, hinting at the fact that uh, Red Hat may probably uh, support for uh, support the product for longer than 10 years. So, so, so some of that, but. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, I was just kind of giving the, the headline figures, you know, the headline figures we give. You know, we have contracts that last longer than the 13 years with LTSS as well. Um, you know, yeah, yeah, just, yeah, I'm sure, you know, we're willing to support stuff if customers pay for it, but I think it also somewhat goes into the marketing into it as well. You know, if we advertise ourselves as a 13 year supported company, you know, does that give customers the impression that we're incredibly conservative and not moving that quickly? You know, whereas, you know, is some of Ubuntu's success down to the fact they trim that down to five years, potentially? You know, so maybe we need two offerings. Maybe we need a fast slee and a slow slee. So I just, I, yeah, wanted to ask the question. Anyone else? We are uh, approaching the beginning of the next session, so we have to. Uh, and this one quickly. So no problem. If anybody has any questions, thoughts, feel free to email me. You, you know where to get hold of me. 